Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Extraordinary Technology Conference 2017. This is the breakout workshop session, and today it is my pleasure to introduce to you David Garraway. David Garraway was born in New York, New York. Um, he visited the mystery spot in Santa Clara at, at a point in his life, and it opened the door to endless wonder. He works to detect the and understand the essential nature of ether. At present, he hails from Los Angeles, California, but he's moving to the great state of Colorado. So I'd like you to welcome David Garraway. Thank you, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm back for the third time at Tesla Tech. And uh, wow, it's really something to be back here. The first two times I was here, I presented at Implosive Vortex Dynamics. And I only had an hour to do so. I made a big mistake, and I tried to put too much in too little time. So consequently, I had to gloss over a lot of the details of um, the dynamics of the implosion of the ether, which occurs um, as we sit here. We're being forced down to the Earth right now by the implosion of the ether. Gravity is an effect, not a force. You're being pushed down to the Earth, not pulled. And uh, I described this fairly well, but I had to... Um, skip over a lot of the details concerning some of the coils I've constructed which detect the ether waves and um, allow people to actually feel the presence of fields around things which the ether causes. There are fields around all objects of this imploding ether. Um, there's a Lagrange point between us and the moon and there's also a Lagrange point between this object and this object. The gravity of this object is stronger on this side of the point and the gravity of this object is stronger on this side of the point. So thus, there's a field around all objects. I call it the Lagrange field, or Lagrange envelope. And you can't detect it unless you have one of these coils. This will actually detect where the ether waves start going this way and where the imploding ether waves start going this way. Originally, what got me started, he introduced me as um, somebody that was um, going to the mystery spot from Santa Clara. Actually, the mystery spot's in Santa Cruz, California. I went there when I was 18, and um, I thought I really understood relativity. People told me, uh, you know, this mystery spot is a gravitational vortex. It's very strange. Uh, balls roll uphill and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, sure, right. Einstein's wrong, right? Okay, I, I believe it. Well, I got there, and sure enough, it was a gravitational vortex. Stuff was rolling uphill and um, all kinds of strange effects. Uh, you know, they have a board where one person stands like this, and then you change spots and you're like three feet apart and you're eye to eye and you change positions and suddenly you're looking over that person's head. And you change back and you're eye to eye again. So the space time in that particular area, it's about 150 foot radius on the side of a hill outside of Santa Cruz. The space time is actually warped there and uh, it defies Einstein's physics completely. Einstein went there once and he left laughing because he knew his work was incomplete and it even has a little placard about his unified field theory on the side of um, the entryway. It's actually a, a tourist trap now. And I knew something was up when I went there and I saw the faces of the tourists coming down the path. And they were all excited and, and aghast at what they had seen at the spot. So ever since then I've been fascinated because I felt like I had been lied to about, you know, the nature of reality and what the mystery spot, you know, showed me was that Einstein was incomplete and that modern science really didn't know what they were talking about. So I went back and studied uh, the ether physics of the Greeks. They were into the ether. And I looked at what they proposed it to be. And then I wondered why Michelson and Morley were incomplete in their uh, determination of the ether. Which brings me to uh, what I'll do is review my presentation of 2013. And you can see some of the, um, the conclusions that I drew, if I can come up with the clicker here. Where did I put that? Hmm, how embarrassing. <laughs> Hold on. John, you got the clicker? Pardon? The clicker. Hello, hello? Okay, good. 
Okay, sorry about that. I shouldn't have started the uh, show so early. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I guess it, it allowed me to get a little warmed up, and I'm not as nervous as I usually am here. So, um, anyway, I went to the mystery spot, and I saw all these strange effects, space-time being warped, and uh, people changing positions, and changing height, and just a few feet. But the thing that clued me in as to the nature of the ether was that the Coriolis effect is reversed in the mystery spot. As you might know, water goes down the drain in the northern hemisphere in a right-handed spiral, and in the southern hemisphere it goes down the drain in a left-handed spiral. And they tell us this is caused by the rotation of the Earth. Well, in the mystery spot, the Coriolis effect is reversed. Water goes down the drain in a left-handed spiral. So this led me to the conclusion that gravity, with this anti-gravity force is coming out of the ground at the mystery spot. Gravity also has torque to it associated with it, um, as well as push and pull. There is anti-gravity. And Einstein says there is no such thing as anti-gravity. So, but I experienced it, so I knew there was, and I realized there's a left-handed torque associated with gravity. So this led me to the conclusion that indeed, uh, modern physics is wrong. The universe is not expanding. We're actually, it did expand a long, long time ago, about 35 billion years ago. Our universe expanded, but there was no matter in it. It was just hot ether, if you will, hot space-time. It reached its maximum size, and then it began to implode. And this is when the ether waves swarm, the vortexes of spiraling waves. Um, there's about 20 of them, a dodecahedron of these spiraling waves to the uh, imploding universe. And they started to form as the universe cooled and began to implode. And this is what gravity is, is the implosive force of the uh, ether. And the funny thing about the ether is it's a de-astrofractating function. I'll get to that later, but it doesn't implode to one point. It implodes to every one thing. So every atom has its own implosion going on around it. Uh, there's maybe only 20 vortexes of imploding energy around the Earth, but as they get closer to the ground, those spirals break up into smaller and smaller venues and smaller spirals. So one big spiral breaks up into smaller spirals, that breaks up into even smaller spirals, and it goes all the way down to the nuclear level. And uh, that's why our universe only looks to be about half as old as it is, because we can only see back to the point where it began to implode. And all matter is really the function of this implosion. The implosion causes electrons to form. They're little eddies in time space. And consequently, you get hydrogen atoms. And that causes stars to form. And of course, we know that elements form in the heart of stars. And uh, higher and higher elements form. And then life itself begins. And uh, right now, we're at the stage where complex life is coming into being. And this is why Michelson and Morley blew it when they were looking for the ether. They made a false assumption. They figured the ether was a uniform substance that was uh, permeating space and that um, it was only flowing in one direction relative to the Earth and our solar system. So at one time a year, the Earth would be going through it in one direction and a light beam from point A to point B would take 10 seconds, say, and 180 degrees out of phase, six months later, the Earth would be going the other direction through the ether, and a light beam would take, say, eight seconds, because it'd be going uphill against the ether this time. But they could find no difference. No matter how they oriented their machine, a light ray always took the same amount of time to go to the mirror and bounce back. So they concluded, well, there is no ether. And that was an erroneous conclusion, because the ether is not a uh, consistent flowing river in space. It's a de-astrofractating function, and everything has its own envelope of imploding ether around it, including their machine that measured uh, the speed of light. So that's why they couldn't find it, is they assumed they made a false assumption. And here's a, a picture of, you know, the de-astrofractation, like I said, the Lagrange point between the moon and the uh, Earth is where spiraling ether starts spiraling in towards the Earth, on one side, and it starts spiraling into the moon on the other side. And uh, this is, it holds true for any body in space or anything like that. It causes gravity and it causes rotation of the Earth. And this implosive force really drives all the functions of nature. It keeps electrons in their orbit, uh, which would decay if they just uh, didn't have anything driving them. And it causes magnetism and all that. We've only dealt with so far with the left-handed energy. There's actually four different waves in the ether. 
And uh, well, this is more on the diastrofractation here. As the vortices get closer to the ground, they'll break up. So every building has one, every person in that building has one, every molecule on that person's skin has one. So it's kind of like a backwards bullet hole. These vortexes come in and break up into smaller and smaller vortexes. And nothing could exist without this vortex of energy holding it together. And uh, as you see, every vortex uh, is around everything. There's basically 20 vortexes around uh, something that in a sphere, but there could be more or less depending on the geometry of the object. And all the vortexes obey something called the golden mean. Uh, gravity accelerates stuff according to this uh, ratio, and it twists things according to this ratio too. You can't see the twist that gravity imparts to things because the twist only becomes evident on the nuclear level. On the uh, macro level, you only see the linear acceleration. You drop something, it goes one foot, one foot, two feet, three feet, five feet, eight feet, 13 feet, 21 feet, and it accelerates in that linear fashion in this Fibonacci series. But it also, the atoms are also being twisted at the same time. So there's two accelerations going on according to gravity, linear and rotational. And the Fibonacci series is um, what produces the golden mean. It's an additive series, one plus one is two, two plus one is three, and you get 5, 8, 13, 21, et cetera. And any two numbers divided, say 34 into 55, will give you 1.618, which is the golden mean. 55 into 34 will give you the golden mean minus 1, which is phi, which is 0 0.6181. So any section of the spiral going out is 1.6 times bigger and than the last 90 degrees, and any section of the spiral going in is 0.618 times as big as the spiral going out next to it. So it's a very interesting number, and everything in nature obeys the golden mean. The rotation on a ram's horns, uh, you see the spiral throughout uh, everywhere. Uh, nature, uh, plants, trees, uh, fish, uh, seashells, even the ratios of our um, bones and our fingers and our body obey this ratio, the golden mean ratio. The Greeks knew about it. They uh, constructed their architecture very much around it. And uh, it permeates nature, but nobody really knows why. And uh, this is to say that the golden mean resonates with phi very much. Phi being five. It's the reason we have five fingers. It's because it resonates with the golden mean. And uh, any vortex has five sides to it. And I could do a whole series on how the golden mean and five fits into the five-sided pentagram. That's why the uh, magicians use a five-sided pentagram. An upright pentagram will attract the positive energy, the right-handed energy, and an upside-down pentagram will attract the evil sinister energy. And there's a reason why right and left are good and bad in yin and yang in this uh, universe. And uh, I'll get to that in a second, but here are the four spirals. Uh, the first one is left in. That goes all the way down to the nuclear level. And then there's a right out that comes also back out from the nuclear level. That bounces around in the, uh, the, the cosmos and becomes, a, every time a right out wave hits something, it uh, bounces off and becomes a right-handed in wave, like it's uh, bouncing off a mirror, it becomes inflected. And then finally we have the left out wave also, which also comes out from the nuclear level. This is, um, well, I should get to this in a minute. This is why here, right is good and left is bad. Um, because the initial wave is left-handed inward, goes down to the nucleus of an atom, pushes that atom out of this universe through three adjacent universes. I have a slide on that in a second. And it comes back radiating out right-handed energy. Now that right-handed energy has to climb uphill against the imploding left-handed energy. And in doing so, it becomes smoother, it becomes more organized, and it becomes tighter. And it's better for keeping stuff together, organizing it, cooling stuff down, crystallizing things, and doing stuff like that. Whereas the left-handed energy is looser and sloppier, and it tends to be centrifugal, while the right-handed energy is centripetal, pulls stuff together. Left-handed energy throws stuff apart. Uh, right-handed energy pulls stuff together. So all your DNA, all DNA in all life forms, as a matter of fact, is a right-handed spiral. And um, that's why, you know, right is good because it promotes life. It keeps stuff together and uh, organizes stuff. Whereas left-handed energy is sinister and evil, tends to rip stuff apart and throw it apart. Um, 
going back, this is a little, I don't know, if John, can you play this now? This is a little video to demonstrate there's actually a vortex around all magnets that is this imploding ether. Hello, this is Al, a.k.a. Magnet Flipper on YouTube. Magnetic flux spin validation. This little video that I made basically shows, in fact, conclusive proof that magnets generate a helical vortex, a tornado type of a magnetic field that is unknown to science. What I have here is basically a magnet, a chrome-plated neodymium magnet sitting in water, sitting on a metal plate with a little tiny insulator that's sitting on. And what I do is I basically apply a voltage to the side of the magnet, okay, inducing a, a helical vortex like a miniature tornado, basically through the gas bubbles that are being generated by the electricity. And it's inducing this magnetic flux to be shown uh, by the frame, uh, called flame, frame dragging off the off the bubbles it's absolutely incredible this is i don't think you're going to see this anywhere on youtube this is actually conclusive proof that in fact there's another field that magnets produce uh, that is unknown to science that can be actually shown and generated with a very simple and expensive method this is looks like a tornado being generated like a, like a like huge tornadoes but it's being generated by purely make, uh, by by purely electrical means. Here is, uh, this is basically rot rotating uh, counterclockwise. The other video was uh, clip was showing clockwise rotation. Uh, it's absolutely incredible. And uh, I hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be able to duplicate this. It's basically a very simple electrolyzer uh, that can show this effect. Here, I reverse the polarity of the magnet. I flipped it upside down, and I apply a voltage to it. When I apply a voltage, the helical field is basically spinning clockwise in this area. And um, I have a uh, description of why this, uh, this is shown. Uh, it goes back to the 1980s to, an, to a man named Howard Johnson. This is an iron slug here to show to my critics that, in fact, that uh, the helical field is generated by a magnetic field as opposed to a left and right hand rule of current flow through the wire. You can see that there is no helical spin. This iron slug is the same size and the weight as the neodymium magnet, and there is no helical spin at all. So this is to all my critics saying that, in fact, this is being generated by a... Uh, magnetic field flow through the wire. This basically here will, uh, will show, in fact, that you can actually do some incredible uh, discoveries based upon this uh, unknown field, uh, probably for, from anti-gravity to free energy to uh, faster, better motors, also to weather phenomena. I mean, look at this. What you have here is basically a tornado that's being generated on top of a magnet. You can study this in slow motion. You can add particles to it, and you have a tornado that you can actually generate right off the bat. And uh, the science is virtually unaware that this magnetic field actually exists. I've never seen this anywhere on YouTube or any type of an explanation of how this happens. This is a slow motion view, and this is about 210 frames that shows, in fact, the bottom of the magnet being uh, generated like in the tornado, and the bubbles begin to form. They're being uh, pulled by the magnetic field uh, as this thing is spinning. And uh, you're going to have a nice, beautiful tornado on top of that. I call it a magnetic vortex. And if you do a search in magnetic vortex, the only thing that's out there is that was discovered by the Germans in the University of Munich in uh, January of this year. And basically, it's revolutionary what they discovered. This only validates the fact that you can actually have a uh, helical spin. And I'm suspecting that the helical spins are everywhere. They're underpinning of the part of the universe that, uh, that, uh, that scientists is talking about. Uh, based upon the devices that you can make upon this is uh, basically healing devices. You can, you can generate a uh, tremendous amount of storage in, uh, in memory cores, in, in memory cards for computers, faster processors, bigger and more powerful motors. 
And uh, application is just endless. This is really shocking that you can actually induce a magnetic field spin like this in a magnet. Now, I'm not sure if this magnet is, in fact, causing the field or if it is a field that is generated, that is, that is basically made by the magnet and that's not, uh, that's not seen by conventional iron filings and uh, flux as conventional science has us believing that, in fact, it's a static field. This is really a dynamic field. I'm going to let you watch this a little bit more, and uh, please read the captions toward the end of the video because they're extremely, they're extremely important. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video. Please read the captions at the end. All right. <clears throat> well, I mean, that goes to show there is a field around everything. Uh, because everything has some magnetism to it. But he was mistaken when he said the magnet generates the field. The field goes into the magnet. The field is always there. The magnet just attracts one half of the field more than the other. The negative half of the magnet applies to the left-handed field and the positive side of the magnet attracts the right-handed side. And that's what these coils attempt to do is derive, separate the waves in the ether and pull more of the right-handed waves in and channel them and use them more. And as you'll see, I have a demonstration later using the coil where it actually promotes uh, the growth of plants. And I think it can be used in healing processes and uh, agricultural processes and all kinds of processes. There's a guy named Dan Winter who has um, a device called the imploder, which is basically a left-handed nozzle that you put on the end of a hose. And it accelerates water in a left-handed golden mean spiral. He sprays it on crops. And you think, well, left-handed, oh, that's not good. That's not going to promote life. But what happens is because left-handed energy loosens things up, it reduces the surface tension of the water. And it allows the water to be absorbed by the crops a lot more easily and more readily than conventional water. And because of this, he has uh, on his website, he's got a beautiful website concerning, he's another present-day scientist that's working on this stuff. He's got a beautiful website that has pictures of uh, plant growth um, due to this vortex nozzle, very simple, Newtonian, you know, non-magnetic, non-electronic device. It's just a simple plastic nozzle that's increasing crop yield by like 10% all over the world. And that's a lot if you think about it, you know, over time and energy. That could really save a lot of energy and feed a lot of people. A lot of different scientists over the years have... Um, known about this vortex energy. Wilhelm Reich was one of them. Um, my dad was the, the host of the Today Show. He actually took a news crew down to the New York Library where they covered the book burning of Wilhelm Reich. He actually had his books burned on the steps of the New York Library back in the 50s. And um, you know about this. Huh? Yeah, that was a, a true Nazi book burning by Wilhelm Reich. Then they threw the poor guy in jail where he died because they denied him his heart condition medicine. And so this kind of stuff was very controversial back in the day. I think the powers that be are starting to loosen up on this kind of technology um, because there's a gentleman out in the lobby that just patented an over-unity device. And I asked him, did they come after you or have you gotten any death threats or anything? He said, no, nope, went right through. I think the powers that be are understanding that this kind of technology has to be now utilized or else they will not have a planet to be greedy on. So I think this kind of technology is more and more coming to the forefront and people are less afraid to explore it and patent it and uh, put it to use. Uh, this is what happens at the nuclear center of an atom. I think they've known this a long time, they just don't talk about it. The left-handed energy goes inward and it spins the nucleus of the atom faster and faster and faster. And it adds more and more wobble to the nucleus so that eventually any point on the nucleus of the atom would be seen to be moving faster than light from one side of the nucleus to the other as it spins faster and faster. This would prove to be a paradox, and nature doesn't like paradoxes,
So the particle shrinks and gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it's accelerated faster and faster and faster around and around. You don't have to accelerate something in a linear fashion to have it go faster than light. You can rotate it faster than light. You just keep adding more accelerations on the x, y, and z axes continuously, and pretty soon it's rotating so fast that it's actually rotating, uh, the surface is rotating faster than light. And it will shrink right down to the Planck length and disappear out of our universe, where it then travels through three other universes. Universes actually come in tetrahedral sets. Um, there's another gentleman out there who is, uh, is the guy I just referred to doing the over-unity um, work that we were talking about subspace or hyperspace yesterday. And that's part of his design in his equipment is a lot of equipment is now using the existence of alternate universes, universes that abut ours to uh, function. Quantum computing would not exist if it wasn't for the actual existence of a universe next door where we can control the data. And um, other devices are coming out, um, over unity devices and whatnot that are actually, there's also um, evidence that virtual particles pop into this universe, they stay here a little while and then they leave. And uh, they never quite completely materialize in this universe because they're, they spend most of their time in other universes. And that's what's actually happening with all the, the matter in this room. It's only here half the time. The rest of the time, it's somebody else's desk. It's somebody else's shoe. It's somebody else's being. And um, it's hard to distinguish this because it happens so quickly. It happens like 600 billion times a second that uh, matter rotates through these universes. But... They're out there, and um, you hate to even think about it because it gives you a headache. I'd rather just think about what goes on in this universe, but you can't really deal with what goes on in this universe unless you look at the functioning of other universes. And uh, this is to say that these imploding ether waves is what actually causes inertia. Uh, Einstein kind of knew this. He knew that inertia and gravity were completely related and had... Um, mathematics to show the relationship, but he didn't know why. He didn't understand really what gravity was or what inertia is. It's just that when you move an object, you're creating a high pressure zone against the ether waves on one side and a low pressure zone on the other side, and it takes a minute for the ether waves to stabilize. So 